This is Retrohammer, Tyranid Grabber Slasher and Inquisitor Crippman from 1990. Hiding away in the mists of time are obscure actors that have played a part in the universe of Warhammer 40,000. For every hero, villain or monster that became part of the ongoing lore, there is one that fell by the wayside and is lost to history. These forgotten and cast aside participants are nonetheless richly realised and characterful, expressing the tangential creative ideas that so memorably define the setting of the first edition. The Tyranids are one of the all-time greatest terrors of science fiction writing, an interstellar swarm of space locusts that are driven to consume everything in their path. Alien in every sense of the word, these extragalactic hordes are the masters of biotechnology, genetically engineering and growing everything from gargantuan living starships to the humble spine fist. Every specialization has a creature or biomorph spawned from the vast birthing vats of the hive ships. Specialization breeds unique and unusual, and the role of the assassin stands perhaps first and foremost to this principle. The sentient races that employ such operatives show characteristics of extraordinary selection, peerless training, intense conditioning, and the provision of bespoke equipment. The Tyranid answer to this requirement is characteristically at odds with preconceptions of the individually minded sentient races. This is the Grabber Slasher. This beast is the strangest of forms, with an almost absurdly distorted and comical body. A pair of short muscular legs is perhaps the only thing that looks remotely normal about the creature, with its head merged into its torso and a single enormous taloned hand sprouting over the beady eyes and toothy maw. To complete the truly alien body plan, a lethal spine extends upwards from its abdomen, counterbalanced to the rear by a stout tail bearing yet another wicked spine. This eldritch horror was a product of the eclectic creativity of John Blanche and featured as part of the concept art for the box game Advanced Space Crusade. Blanche's original drawing was further developed in a picture by Stephen Tappin and a single metal miniature was sculpted by Kev Adams. What truly gave life to the Grabber Slasher was a short story written by Lindsay D. Ledoux Patton, printed in White Dwarf 131 in November 1990, following on from a story of the same name in the previous issue following the said Inquisitor's investigations of strange and unexplained happenings. Patton's story told a tale of the life cycle and mission of this deadly biomorph as it fell to a planet and then sought out the canny cryptman singled out for death by the implacable hive mind of High Fleet Kraken. This fictional foray into the lore of Warhammer 40,000 served as part of the promotion of the upcoming Advanced Space Crusade game published the same year. Within this game of hive ship incursions by the Space Marines, the Grabber Slasher was an in-game unit available to the Tyranid player that fulfilled a particular role as a close-range ambush killer, well suited to the cramped innards of the bio-vessels. A similar appearance did not happen in the tabletop sphere, so while this vicious creature provided hive mind players endless amusement via the disembowelment of unsuspecting Astartes at inconvenient moments, it was soon left behind and forgotten as Games Workshop moved the Tyranids in different directions and ceased development of the Space Crusade line. Nonetheless, the Grabber Slasher was a fascinating design of the early 40k era. Artistic drawing, story and miniature sculpting combined to give this bizarre monster life and was a typically peculiar mix of comedy and horror that so characterised the game of that time. And thank you very much for joining me for this episode of Retrohammer, where we are looking at the Tyranid Grabber Slasher from 1990. In front of us on this pedestal, we have an example of the single miniature and the only miniature that was produced by Games Workshop of this fascinating creature. What we're going to do in this episode is we're going to take a journey through the life and the creation of the Grabber Slasher. Firstly, we're going to take a tour around the miniature and make a few comparisons to some other models to give you an idea of just exactly what this creature was like in dimensions and how it would have compared to a couple of opponents from the time. We're then going to look at the art, so starting with John Blanche's concept artwork, then moving on to Stephen Tappin's more developed piece. Then I've prepared a set of readings from the story of Inquisitor Crippman from White Dwarf 131 to show the sections that describe the Grabber Slasher and its confrontation with Inquisitor Crippman. So that is what we're going to do in this episode. I think it's going to be a fascinating journey. And from this, we'll have yet another demonstration of just how rich the early Warhammer 40,000 universe was, because all of this is hanging around this one single concept. So let us begin by taking a look at this miniature.
The grabber slasher, it is mounted on a 25 millimeter base and this is cast in white metal. Uh, so the old style lead white metal tin alloy. So it's, uh, it's got that characteristic color to it over time. It's quite a soft metal. It's a lot easier to work than the modern ones. As I said in the introduction, this miniature was sculpted by Kev Adams, who uh, was a veteran of the early 40K era and is still active today. And if you look around, you can still see some of his work. So let's, let's just get a feel for this strange creature. I mean, what is it? What on earth is it? I mean, I suppose the best way of characterizing it is it's, uh, it's almost like a hand has grown out of its head and we've got this gigantic spine at the front and a similar almost as large one at the rear and it has this gaping toothy maw now those of you well i think just about anyone who's familiar with the universe of 40k and certainly familiar with the early road trader miniatures will clearly see the visage of an orc sat in the middle of the torso of this beast and indeed that is the inference of this creature. Part of the development of the Tyranids early in 40k was that they assimilate biomass and genetic material from everything they encounter and conquer and the orcs as all races did were not immune to this assimilation. They used various components from the captured biology to build their own creatures and the concept of the grabber slasher was it's a creature that harnesses the resilience and the aggression of an orc but repurposed to a biological assassin so absolutely fascinating idea and i mean let's be honest the miniature has a certain humorous look to it and i'm sure there was quite a lot of tongue-in-cheek with designing this and essentially i think the idea of this creature's operation is it would waddle up to its intended victim grab their head and disembowel them with this enormous spine or you know just chew them to death with its enormous mouth Comicalness aside though, there is some clever sculpting that has gone into this uh, and we'll, let's just pick those features out. So I drew attention to obviously its enormous claw and then we also have the spine. So we have the grabber slasher element of the name. It has two squat little feet and legs at the side, almost too small to move. And when we come to the story, you'll see that the writing reflects its unusual gait Running down its spine, it has a series of chitinous plates. So these are armor to protect its nervous system. At the rear, we have a, another spine. And then the bit that I really like is if we see here and here, what Adams did is he sculpted this as if at one point this had a set of independent arms, but they then fuse into this overall head hand and I guess the inference is this additional muscle mass increases the strength of this fearsome limb. Let's take it out of its base and then we'll just have a little look at the tab because uh, there's a little bit more story there. The thing that amuses me about the base of this is when Kev Adams has sculpted it, he puts slasher grabber. Now in all the other literature I could find, it's actually called a grabber slasher. And certainly when we look at the advanced Space Crusade material, we will see that. It always interests me though, as to why these little quirks happen. Was it a case that they started off by calling it a slasher grabber and then turned it round to a grabber slasher? Or maybe Kev Adams was just having a little bit of fun writing it the wrong way around. Yeah, so you have it, slasher grabber. And then on the reverse of the tab, we have the production date, which as I mentioned earlier, was 1990. These miniatures were sold, uh, I think they were, they were sold retail. Um, they're quite rare though. I don't know how long they produce them for. And certainly because it only got linked to the Advanced Space Crusade in terms of game, it never, I suppose, had a great deal of application is a mass battle unit. I mean, for example, I never remember the Tyranids being able to have a unit of grabber slashers. And I suppose with Advanced Space Crusade having a relatively short lifespan, we can see why the miniature was relatively rare and uh, certainly acquiring this example was not cheap. 
and looking at the top, I mean, yeah, it has a huge three fingered talon hand at the top. And clearly, as I was intimating in the introduction, this is a Tyranid answer to the assassin is completely focused on the particular mode of attack. And obviously it's been configured to assassinate creatures around human size. It would work against Eldar, Orcs, and the whole host of other sentient races because they're all roughly the same size. And I think this is quite capable of taking on opponents quite a lot larger than it is because it is just purely focused on killing and through a very particular method of grabbing a head and impaling with this spine, which carries a lethal venom as well. So yeah, what a fascinating little creature. Absolutely fascinating sculpt. Funny, you know, it certainly has a, an element of comedy to it, as a lot of things in Rogue Trader did. But at the same time, it is also quite a terrifying alien concept, and particularly when we get to the story by Lindsay Patton, you will appreciate that. We'll pop the little critter back on his base. And now we're going to just do a couple of size comparisons against models of the era. Let's take a common protagonist. And here we have a RTB-01 plastic space marine. This is one of my two surviving space wolves from the time. This was my librarian. A mate of mine uh, did came up with this pose originally. We just used some paper to make the book, and I so liked what he did, I, uh, I had to do one of my own. And this is painted in ye olde space wolf grey colour, the original style. And those of you who remember 40k Rogue Trader uh, will be familiar with the sort of iconography and uh, did a, you know, not a bad attempt for the time. A little bit of freehand painting his librarian book on his uh, shoulder pad. Not really that good by today's standards, but that was then. And this was a banner that was printed in White Dwarf, if I remember rightly. And I cut, I photocopied, cut out and painted. Not particularly well, but it's nice. So yeah, anyway, that's enough of him. Let's see how the grabber slasher compares. As we see, it's not actually that big. Certainly the sculpt, it's probably about man height, maybe there or thereabouts. But because so much of its mass sits low down, it looks perhaps lower than it is. But obviously we're looking at the top of the hand. And these things could leap long distances, yeah, not to be trifled with. So there's a space marine. Now one of its kin, and a much more sophisticated in a way, certainly in terms of thinking power creature. This is a, the original Gene Stealer that was produced by Games Workshop, and it's still in its original paint scheme. It's a little bit chipped and worn. This is my first ever Gene Stealer model. And yeah, there we go. There's the Grabber Slasher alongside the Gene Stealer. So yeah, quite small. But perhaps that small size is an advantage because this is an assassin. If it can get into smaller places to hunt its prey down, then all the better. Let's do something more modern and compare against a space marine of the current era. Here we've got, this is a miniature by Forgewald. This is a space marine wearing Mark II Crusade armor. This is out of my Iron Hands Force. Very nice model, this is beautiful. As you can see, I have a rebased this guy onto a 32 millimeter base. And as often happens with uh, moving forward in time with Games Workshop models, the new guy is still quite a bit bigger. But as I said, I think this would easily take down the Space Marine just because of its sheer power and singular purpose in its body plan design. And let's bring it up to the ultra modern with a Primaris Space Marine. Here's one of my Iron Hands Primaris Marines. A, this particular one is an intercessor from Squad Valencio. And now if we put the grabber slasher alongside it, it looks quite small. But as I say, easily get that hand around his head and that spine is long enough to penetrate all the way through his chest. So I still say that's one savaged and dead Primaris Marine if the grabber slasher comes after him and gets him. Now 
Now we've looked at the miniature and made some comparisons, let's move on and examine the artwork that accompanied the Grabber Slasher. So we're going to change to a different camera angle and look at the art. This is White Dwarf 131 from November 1990. And as we can see from the colour, Tyranids were in the air because this is a picture of some Space Marine Scouts from the upcoming at the time Advanced Space Crusade game. And if we flip it over onto its back, we can see we've got these Tyranid Warriors. And of course, these are an artistic rendition of the original plastic Tyranid Warriors, but not exactly the original Tyranid, which of course was the Protonid, which I've done a separate Retro Hammer episode on. So let's take a look inside this White Dwarf. There are a few things that are of interest here. We have the story of Inquisitor Crippman, which we're going to come back to later. But what we really want to look at here is this article, Advanced Space Crusade, a preview of our soon to be released game of battle between the Imperium and the invading Tyranid High Fleet Kraken, page 47. Let's go on over there. Here we go. And here we have that lovely picture of a Tyranid warrior fighting the scouts again. Just a little reflection here on how Games Workshop used to use its magazine. This is an advert for independent stockists of Games Workshop products, uh, which they regularly used to carry adverts for, and other third parties, an indication of how they've changed. This is an article, it was basically a big advert, the game Advanced Space Crusade. It's of particular interest because within it, we've got the concept art, the grabber slasher. So this was the actual game you got. Advanced Space Crusade was a really interesting game. I had it at the time. And while it shares the name Space Crusade with collaboration that Games Workshop did with MB Games on the Space Crusade itself game, this was a much more advanced and complex rule set, as well as the greater depth and complexity of the actual gameplay. It added a whole campaign system, which was actually pretty in-depth, allowed you to create a whole series of battles around an attack on a Tyranid High Fleet by a group of Space Marines. So it was a cool game, a bit complicated perhaps, but it was good. And as well as the actual game, we had, shall we say, the fluff and the art to go with it. And this is what was really interesting. You know, there's a set of the painted miniatures from the game. You've got 15 scouts and six Tyranid warriors. Some nice art, including this piece by Adrian Smith. Really cool. Some colour plates and you know, some paint schemes. Size of the Emperor, very significant chapter in this particular story. In terms of our retro hammer journey, though, it is these small black and white sketches that are of real interest to us. And in particular, just down here, we zoom in. This here is John Blanche's original sketch of the Grabber Slasher. If I pick up the magazine, we can get a closer look. And there we go. Very recognizable in concept. It's a final miniature that was designed and sculpted and is quite humorously written here. He called it the Grab and Slash, which still amuses me now. Uh, they must have changed the name to the Grab and Slash, but Grab and Slash. It sounds like it could be the name of a 70s cop series on TV. And he's also noted out the genetic provenance of this creature, that it's an orc. There's some other interesting concepts that were in here. This one in particular, here we have the flamethrower, which is based around squat DNA. Again, this idea that the Tyranids assimilate creatures and utilize their DNA into bioweapons, something called Snapper, a selection of Tyranid concepts. Just looking at this for something sketched back in 1990, that looks a little bit like the head of the Deacon alien from the film Prometheus. So perhaps that was prophetic. There's a variety of other things. This is a very distinctive alien creature or Tyranid bioconstruct. It was a sort of spider thing with a tube and I think it was supposed to be a recycling squig. I always like that one. And there is actually a miniature of that available, all sorts of sketches and ideas and concepts that John Blanche had. And this, you know, is clearly the eclectic creativity that I referred to in the introduction. Gun and slashing sword. Lots of these, in effect, were realised in later Tyranid models and all the different weapons that are shown here. Large slug gun and a field gun. They don't look entirely dissimilar to the biovore concepts that came later either. Perhaps a pyrovore and some larger bioconstructs as well. And just to go back, there is our grabber slasher concept. There's John Blanche's original sketch. Now we'll go to another part of the White Dwarf, the Inquisitor Crippman story, to take a look at the more developed sketch by Stephen Tappin of the Grabber Slasher. So here we have the story of Inquisitor Crippman, and within it, here we have something that is much closer 
to the final model. The model is pretty much identical to this drawing by Stephen Tappin. The exception of this is a three-fingered hand, and I think that on the model we've just got a two-fingered hand as opposed to three. A little bit of an adaptation, but yeah, the proportions on this are very much more like the model. That then raises a question which came first. Did Kev Adams sculpt the miniature, or did Stephen Tappin do the more developed artwork? I don't know that. It's difficult to know because Games Workshop was very interchangeable with how it did its art and design. There were models that came out of artistic design, but then throughout the whole 40k era, and particularly the early 40k era, Rogue Trader time, they used miniatures they'd sculpted and drew them into art. And it was a great way of selling models, isn't it? If you see a picture, then you see a model on the shelf that looks exactly the same, essentially the same. It's a great way of selling a model. I don't know exactly what the chicken and egg situation is with this particular sketch in relation to the miniature we looked at earlier. Nonetheless, a great picture and takes Blanche's sketch and makes it look much more terrifying and scary. And certainly this face looks pretty deranged and not something you would want to mess with ever. So that shows us the art of the Grabber Slasher. So now we've looked at the drawings of the Grabber Slasher and we've also perused the miniature as well. The next thing, of course, is to think about the lore because for me the thing that really made the grabber slasher memorable is a story that's printed across these four pages following the rendition of the grabber slasher by stephen tappin we now go forward to look at the rulebook from advanced space crusade and this is what we are now looking at. What we have here is a page in the rule book from Van Space Crusade, published in 1990, which had a bit of additional background information on the Grabber Slasher. And down at the bottom, we can also see Stephen Tappin's drawing. It's interesting to look at this because this is the only real in-universe description of what Grabber Slasher does, apart from the story, which presents a fictional representation of a Grabber Slasher. And it's very interesting just to read this and point out it makes a clear link here between the orc and the grabber slasher. So orc DNA has been used to create this creature and it mentions the fact it contains fungal spores within its bloodstream. And fascinatingly as well, it adds an additional ability to the grabber slasher, which is a capability to change its form to match something else, almost like a polymorph or perhaps even a doppelganger. So again, emphasizing its role as an assassin. And it does actually say as well, it takes about a day for the creature to adjust in form. While it is single-minded to an incredible degree, it does also have some interesting stealth abilities to help as an assassin, because I mean, you can imagine, because the creature looking like that can't infiltrate anywhere. However, if it's able to consume a victim and then adopt their shape, you could tell that would help it get close to the target of its assassination attempt. So yeah, very interesting little bit there. This page also describes Grabber Slash's method of attack, which is a bounding leap a grab and an impaling stab with its enormous spine. So now we're going to leave Advanced Space Crusade and return back to White Dwarf 131 to continue our journey. I'm now going to read excerpts from the story Inquisitor Cryptman by Lindsay D. Ledoux Patton from White Dwarf 131, published in 1990. This story, which focuses on Inquisitor Cryptman and his investigations on Kendrick's world, featured the Grabber Slasher as an antagonist, a deadly assassin seeking him out. These following passages characterised this strange and bizarre alien and also demonstrated its horrific nature. Ten miles down the valley, a lone meteor shrieked through the cold evening air. Its impact with the hillside created a small crater and its heat charred a black ring in the surrounding heather. A nauseating smell like carbonised meat rose from the meteorite, which was roughly ovoid in shape and about two feet high. Curiously, its ridged and warty form was more like some bloated alien organ than a lump of sterile rock. After a few minutes, the meteorite toppled over on its side. A large native game bird approached and peered at it with one greedy eye. The cancerous looking thing shook again, faint sounds emanating from within. The bird stalked closer until it was right beside the meteorite which still trembled spasmodically. The bird raised its beak and plunged it straight down into the meteorite, splitting it open like an overripe fruit. A spray of yellow sputum burst out as a formless creature catapulted onto the bird, engulfing it in a glistening organic mass. It was all over very quickly. The creature wrapped itself tightly around its prey, compressing it, absorbing it. No feather or claw was wasted. 
As it contracted round the bird, a trickle of blood and bodily fluids dribbled out, turning the charred ground into a disgusting bloody black mud. Slow changes rolled over the creature's body as it developed. A more consistent appearance, an embryonic spine and rib cage erupted from amid obscenely pulsating organs, its pallid skin darkened and sprouting stubbly feathers. With prolonged sucking noises, a thick neck and head worked their way out from the top of the creature, while strong clawed legs sprouted from underneath. A stubby tail elongated from its spine and two beady eyes popped into existence. For an hour it lay so on the ground, twitching its new limbs, recovering from the ordeal of its metamorphosis. Finally, it lurched unsteadily to its feet and shook its body like a wet dog might do, shaking off a little hail of ash, bone fragments and bloody saliva. The creature now resembled a hideous mismatch of embryo bird and insect. Raising its powerful head, it sniffed the air, then loped off over the heather and rocks into the twilight gloom. Cold. This place is cold. Cold and hard. Clean air carries scent well. Little life all around. Animals. Birds. Stupid. Slow. Good for eating. Hungry. Need more food. Need more bulk. We must hunt. Many large life upwind. Find the place of stone. Find and kill the prey. The creature gallops tirelessly up the valley racing over the scree, bounding over rocks and streams. It broke its course once to devour a large grazing rodent, and by the time it had finished absorbing its bulk and reforming its body, the sun was setting. Its body was now larger, thicker, less suited for speed, more suited for attack. The creature's neck was losing definition, causing its head to recede into its shoulders, its more deepened and widened, drool running off ranks of long, sharp incisors. It now somewhat resembled a crudely flayed wolf. The old monastery squatted at the head of the valley, limed in blood by the setting sun. It was a huge, sprawling edifice, built centuries ago by a dour people with more interest in solidity than aesthetics, and more zeal for truth than comfort. Men much like Inquisitor Cryptman, in fact. Built into and onto a massive granite crag, it almost seemed a natural extension of the rock itself. When the Imperium rediscovered Kendrick's world, it was decided to use the empty building as their primary communications and administrative stronghold. The creature crouched behind a rock, spying out the place. Its eyes had widened to cope with the fading light, and organ buds waved from its forehead, reading the scents on the air currents. With a soft, rippling noise, long hooked claws shot from its paws, its tail shortened and thickened, and sprouted a cruel stinger. As the sun finally sunk behind the monastery, the creature leapt onto the rocks, propelled upwards on its powerful hind legs. Hunger. Hunger. Smell large life above. I go up. We recognise this place of stone. Our prey is here. Remember his scent. Far above, a young guard patrolled the parapets of the monastery, rubbing his hands together to warm them. His lasgun weighed heavily across his shoulder, and he shifted it to a more comfortable position. From his vantage point, he could see down the barren valley to the ranks of mountains beyond, a dreamscape of misty greys and browns in the fading light. The glow globes spluttered into life, their feeble light making the place surreally two-dimensional. Defaced statues of forgotten native gods crowded the walls, their shapes worn by weather and time. The young guard paced restlessly up and down his stretch of the battlements. He had been on patrol for three hours now, and the cold winter night had set in. Hearing the wind moan and wail, he shivered and pulled his cloak more tightly about him, feeling hemmed in by stone and shadows. He did not hear the approach of death. As he turned away, something catapulted over the parapet and smashed into the back of his neck, knocking him to the floor. Its warm body enveloped his head. The musky stench was disgusting. He dropped his lasgun and flung his arms up to his head, trying to tear the creature away. Savage claws raked at his throat, ripping open his windpipe. He tried to scream, but all his horror and pain just came as a rackly gurgle. His questing hands pulled at the thing, futilely trying to pull it off. But it was slippery with corrosive fluid. Razor-sharp teeth flayed the skin from his fingers. The pain was terrible, building up inside him with no release. Fire seared through the back of his neck as claws cut deep through the top of his spine, cracking his vertebrae apart. Sensation flared and dimmed. 
The last thing he felt was something punching through his eye sockets. Food. Warm food. Eat and absorb. Grow larger, grow stronger. Teeth to tear, claws to rend. Our enemy is here. We hate him. We will find him and destroy him. Enter the place of stone. Seek out our enemy. Hunt him and destroy him. The creature reared up its body and stretched open its jaws, revealing row upon row of dripping, needle-sharp teeth. Swishing its tail from side to side, it went down the steps into the monastery. All that remained of the guard was a messy pile of torn and bloody clothing, a slimy smear on the stone, and a lone, disconsolate eyeball. The creature padded awkwardly down the gloomy corridors of the old monastery, vent-like nostrils flaring, reading the scents carried on the air currents. It was the height of a tall man, but with a much thicker body, its centre of gravity lower than a human's. Its two upper arms were short and coarse, glistening with raw tendons and skinless muscle. Neck and shoulders had virtually fused together, and its face, mostly composed of its ferocious gaping maw, seemed to be sinking down into its torso. A rudimentary limb stood out of the top of its head, from which extended a crude three-fingered clawed hand. Its back legs too had shortened and broadened, and a secondary tail reached forward from between them, tipped with a hard, horny substance. The protuberant backbone also ended in a muscular tail, which curved upwards and backwards. Corrosive venom dripped from its tip, leaving tiny pot marks in the flagged stone floor. Flexible, chitinous plates ran down its back, and when it moved, pulsing phosphorescent organs showed through. It excluded a disgusting slime continuously, occasionally shaking off the excess and leaving a rank and slippery trail in its wake. Man, body, good food, easy to absorb. I am strong, I shall destroy. The prey is close, I have tracked him down. I am the living weapon. We remember this place of cold stone darkness. We remember Cryptman. We come. We are retribution. Cryptman returned to the reports. There were numerous accounts of extra-normal occurrences, disturbingly similar to those on Kendrick's world. Contact with the size of the Emperor, erratic but possible, just. Some mention of unidentified alien craft spotted by a Space Wolves patrol on the edge of a spiral arm. Then communications lost. Always this problem with communications. Three more merchant spaceships were missing, not in the warp, but normal space. New outbreaks reported of Steeler cult activity. All these things could be taken as isolated incidents, but he was convinced there must be a connection. Why couldn't he see it? Understand the pattern. Everything whirled round in his head. Gene Steelers, the Lamenters, meteors, monsters, mutilated bodies, the shadow in the warp. His head ached trying to contain all of it. Carell returned to the office, out of breath. The monastery is not under attack, asked Crippman. No, sir, but whatever killed Harrell is now in the building. There was a slimy trail of footprints leading down from the tower steps. All the guards are looking for it, but it could be anywhere. He made an encompassing gesture of hopelessness. Crippman understood the problem. The monastery was so huge and rambling, they were still discovering new areas in it. Assuming the invader didn't lose itself and starve to death, it could hide out indefinitely. Carell dropped three heavy iron bars across the door to secure it. Drawing his last pistol from its concealed holster under his robes, he took up guard by the door, weapon in hand. Crippman hoped the guards could deal with the invader quickly. He should be supervising the hunt himself, but he had to go talk to the astropath Farron first. With a sudden, wrenching impact, the door splintered open, throwing splinters of wood and steel across the room. The creature leapt in and gathered itself to attack. Crippman was stunned by the creature's dramatic entrance and horrific appearance. He stood motionless for a couple of fatal seconds. Looking into its glittering black eyes, he saw himself, his scared face broken into a myriad of tiny images. He knew this creature wanted him, wanted to kill him, and the creature knew it had found its prey. He grabbed wildly for his bolter, knocking it off his desk onto the floor. Seeing its opportunity, the creature started towards him, propelling itself forwards with an odd, bounding, striding motion. Carell leapt between the monster and Crippman, firing his last pistol at point-blank range. It turned on him with incredible speed for its ungainly shape, clasping his head with its head hand, smashing both of his arms against his head, crushing his skull. Gobbets and brain fragments fountained across the room. Continuing the motion, it swept Carell's body up into the air and hurled it with tremendous force into the ceiling, breaking his bones with a sickening crunch. 
Carell's intervention had gained the Inquisitor enough time to retrieve his bolter from the floor. He leapt to his feet and opened fire. The shell exploded from his weapon and tore into the creature's back in a ball of smoke and yellow flame. The bolter bucked in his hand, the recoil jarring his arms. Amazingly, the creature seemed undamaged, or at least unbothered by its wound. It turned and charged at Crippman, its three-clawed arms raised, teeth bared. Instinctively, he kicked over his chair, flung himself to the ground and rolled under the desk as the creature landed on top of it with a crunch. He fired blindly up through the wood and rolled out the other side. He came out of his roll in a fluid motion, simultaneously firing another shell at the creature, which had jumped down from the other side of the desk. This attack had some effect, ripping away part of its spine to expose the muscles and spraying the far wall with red mucus. Enraged, the creature opened its mouth and screamed a horrid, gurgling cry, then lifted the edge of a desk and sent it crashing towards the Inquisitor. Crippman couldn't move out of the way fast enough. He was knocked over, one of his legs caught under the heavy desk. He fired wildly as he fell, but the shot missed and exploded through the window, spraying shards of glass everywhere. Before he could pull his leg free, the creature had jumped on him, scrabbling and clawing at his body, trying to pinion his arms. Mighty Emperor, give me strength, prayed Crippman, struggling to escape the steely grip of the claws. As the creature's grip on him tightened, it stabbed at him with the forward thrusting tail, trying to spike open his chest. Crippman realised that the creature was slowly, inexorably drawing him closer to it, towards its gaping maw. The fetid rank odour it exhaled made him gag. As the creature forced him up to its mouth, Crippman, with a superhuman effort, managed to free his right arm and fire his bolt gun straight into the creature's mouth. The shell shot down the creature's throat and exploded inside its body. The creature was torn apart from the inside. Chunks of flesh and bone rained over the room. Crippman was flung violently back against the wall. He felt his ribs go in a lance of pain. The whole attack had taken but a few seconds. Crippman was dizzy with the ferocity of it. The immediate danger passed, his adrenaline wore off and he doubled over from the pain. His left arm was broken, several ribs cracked, burns ran down the right side of his body. Carell's headless and broken body lay under the window. One smooth hand still clasped around his last pistol. Crippman gently pried loose the young man's nerveless fingers and deactivated the weapon. He had been genuinely fond of the boy. Now he owed Carol his life and no way of repaying the debt. Staggering over the remains of his desk, Crippman fumbled through the wreckage looking for stim pills and painkillers. His foot slipped on some bloody bit of the alien carcass and he fell into the chair, gasping with pain. What was this creature? Why had it been sent to kill him? And who had sent it? He had no doubts that the creature had been instructed to do this, and like a mindless monster, it had attacked with ruthless efficiency, refusing to be distracted, as though guided by some cold and calculating alien intelligence. The mixture of stimulants and painkillers was making him feel heady. A terrible understanding assailed his consciousness. This creature is the link, he realised. Somehow this creature connects all these events, all the weird happenings. He could almost see the pattern. The Imperium must be warned. Clasping his tattered black jacket around him, Kryptman staggered painfully out of his office, heading towards the astral chamber. I hope you've enjoyed those excerpts from the story Inquisitor Kryptman that vividly painted a picture in the reader's minds of the creature known as the Grabber Slasher. And here we are again with our miniature of the Grabber Slasher sculpted by Kev Adams. I hope you enjoyed that bit of science fiction horror from the White Dwarf magazine. And as I say, it certainly made a big impression on me at the time. Well, I was only quite young, I was 15, so I guess I was quite impressionable. But I st still think even now, it's a good story. And it certainly shows how a well-written piece of lore can bring a concept of a creature to life in Warhammer 40,000. What was the fate of the Grabber Slash then? Well, unfortunately, our big-handed friend didn't have much else to do in the universe of Warhammer 40,000. It was certainly a memorable little chap with regards to the game Space Crusade and a lot of people I think of the era remember the story of Inquisitor Crippment well but beyond that the concept didn't go any further and with the exception of this single miniature and its appearance into Advanced Space Crusade I don't think it ever made it onto the tabletop. I certainly don't remember seeing any rules for using the Grabber Slasher in Warhammer 40,000. I never remember seeing it particularly 
significantly in the shops and I, I don't know how many they made and how long they made it for. So Games Workshop went in a different direction with the Tyranids and in particular they seem to move away from the hybridization concept where the idea that was very much epitomized by the Grabber Slasher that the Tyranids used genetic material from other races to create bioconstructs and those resultant bioconstructs were still recognizable at least in part as the original race. So yeah, and I guess as part of that artistic idea, the Grabber Slasher didn't go any further. And perhaps somewhat poetically, one might say, that was somewhat like how the creature was portrayed in the story of Inquisitor Crittman, created for a very specific purpose, rapid growth to life, a brief flurry of significance, and then it was gone. So perhaps with retrospect, that story is almost allegorical. And with that, we've reached the end of our journey of the story of Tyranid Grabber Slasher Biomorph Assassin. I hope you've enjoyed this retro hammer journey through the art, miniatures and lore of the Grabber Slasher. If you've got any memories of this creature and how it was used in any of the games at the time, I'd love to hear those in the comment section. The final thing that remains to do is to thank all my patrons who made this episode possible. If you'd like to support future Retro Hammer projects and episodes, you can do so through Patreon. There are links in the description to my Patreon page. So if you enjoy Retro Hammer and looking back in depth and detail at the models of the early Rogue Trader era and Warhammer 40,000 in general, please do check that out. All your support is very gratefully received. And now a big thank you to all my patrons who have supported this episode. People like Red Panda 7, Laurent Jaloux, Diego Flores, Kyle, Alexander Korn, Martin Tamala, Zerius, Patriots, Not Spunny, Robert Allen Fairburn IV, Stuart Waitley, Harris Richards, Mikey Royce, John Finucane, Tom Strongberg, Christian Ulo, and JD Velades. That was Retrohammer. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.